Okay, um, let's do case number five. Um, this is a 75-year-old woman with a nodule on the lower eyelid. And there are pictures of all these in the very nice um, book that um, Agnes uh, put together and translated. So you can uh, see all of those. So 75-year-old woman with nodule on the lower eyelid. I eyelid, excuse me. And do I have... Oh, okay, good. So here you can see a, a cystic lesion, and it connects uh, focally to the surface of the skin. There's a lot of debris and, and um, secretion material um, trapped in the lumen with blood. And then there's a little focus down here of cells that are outside the cyst in the dermis. So let's look first at the cyst. There, that's better. The epidermis has to be at the top, right? Okay. So if you just had the cyst here, I mean, this could be the, if you didn't have this little island, this could be the top of, um, of an epidermoid cyst or follicular and fundibular cyst. But as you go down here, you begin to see the lining uh, changes. And what you have is a kind of double layer cuboidal or to columnar lining with a, a small little luminal projections or apocrine snouts that stick into the lumen. It's a little hard to see here. You could even wonder if there's cilia at first glance, but I think they're little, little snouts that protrude into the lumen. So this area here, to my eye, looks identical to a hydrocystoma, which is a benign uh, cystic lesion from sweat gland or duct origin that usually arises on the upper cheek or the eyelids, um, often in adult women, and they're often multiple. But as we go down further here, you can see, look, there's a little duct here that kind of looks similar, but starts to have some tiny papillary structures. And there's more papillary structures here. And then down towards the bottom, the papillary structures become more pronounced and they protrude into the lumen of the cystic space. Um, I guess it's okay. All right. uh, the nuclei are um, uh, round and uniform and a bit hyperchromatic. On this scan, it's a bit difficult to see the uh, chromatin pattern but they don't look cytologically malignant to my, um, to my eye at first glance at least. So um, a lot of times if I see this appearance of a solid or papillary areas protruding into a hydrocystoma, I would call this uh, a cyst adenoma, okay? But in more recent years, in the past 10 years or so, there is a newer entity that's been described. And now, anytime I think I see a cyst adenoma, if it looks like a hydrocystoma that has any cellularity or papillary growth, particularly if there's some blue uh, mucin with it, I wonder about the possibility of endocrine mucin-producing sweat gland carcinoma. And I'm starting to wonder if maybe all of the things, or almost all of the things that look like cystadenoma are maybe actually this. So these have been described in, and um, Arthur Zembowitz from the United States, uh, from uh, Massachusetts, is one of the, the people who first described and uh, has uh, written the most probably about this entity. Um, if you do neuroendocrine markers, they will be positive for synaptophysin or to a lesser extent chromogranin. And I've found more recently, if you have it in your lab, uh, INSM1, insulinoma-like um, protein. And uh, that works quite nicely as a nice nuclear stain that stains many different uh, endocrine tumors, Merkel cell carcinoma, this tumor, and, and others. So these are, although they are called carcinoma, they are indolent and have a good prognosis. They do need to be excised. But what we, what we understand now is that these probably serve as a form of precursor lesion to invasive mucinous carcinoma, which also usually arises near the eyelids or, or adjacent areas in adults. 
So whenever I see this, we go and look and see, are there any areas of invasive mucinous carcinoma? And in this case, there is. Right here. There we have islands of bland, relatively uniform round cells that are arranged into nests or islands that are floating in a background, pools of loose blue mucin in the middle of the dermis. So you've all probably seen mucinous carcinomas, either of the skin or the breast or other parts of the body before. But in, in the skin, they have a very similar appearance to when they occur elsewhere. They, they can have atypia sometimes, but most of the ones I've seen were relatively bland and uniform cytology rather than pleomorphism. But they can have a range of different features. So mucinous carcinomas seem to arise from this precursor. When you look at mucinous carcinomas, some of them seem to arise out of cystic areas or solid areas that are within a dilated sweat duct space. And the, one of the papers it talked about that, that the, they're kind of analogous, the, the background precursor areas are analogous morphologically to what you see in the breast. Usual ductal hyperplasia, atypical ductal hyperplasia, and ductal carcinoma in situ. So they made that connection way back that, that there were areas that looked kind of similar to breast, those different breast lesions. And then a lot of times they would see an invasive mucinous carcinoma component growing adjacent to that kind of precursor lesion that's developing within a sweat duct. I think probably those lesions all represent the same thing as this endocrine mucin producing sweat gland carcinoma. Now that we've made the connection that these usually have a neuroendocrine immunophenotype. So uh, the reason that this is important is number one, if you just see this lesion by itself, without invasive mucinous carcinoma, it still probably should be completely excised and the patient should be followed. The outcomes, as far as I understand, are very good, but they, they probably should be completely treated, okay? The other reason is that when you have a mucinous carcinoma, an invasive mucinous carcinoma in the dermis, there's always the question of, is this primary from the skin? Or is this a metastasis? And whenever you raise that question, that creates a great deal of difficulty for the treating physician and the patient. Because what do you do? Do you full body scan, head to toe, a breast exam? I mean, like, how far do you pursue that? It's actually um, it's a simple thing to write in your report, rule out metastasis, but actually creates a lot of difficulty and expense uh, in working up the patient. So in my experience so far, whenever I've seen mucinous carcinoma in skin, it has almost always been primary, especially if it's near the eyes. I have never personally seen a metastatic carcinoma from the breast or any internal site near the eye. Is it possible? Sure, anything's possible, right? If you have to ask, can it happen? Yes, it can happen. It will eventually. Give it enough time and no, or someone else will publish two examples of metastatic something that should never be able to happen, but yet it does. So anytime I say in a lecture, you never see this, it'll come out next year, someone will publish a case of it. So this is the, the joy and the pain of pathology, right? Is there, nothing is ever certain, but we always get to learn new things, so. All right, but in any case, I feel like from a statistical standpoint, unless the patient has a known history, very unlikely that a, a mucinous carcinoma around the eye is a metastasis, but it is theoretically possible. Thank you. The reason that this, knowing about the endocrine mucin producing sweat gland carcinoma, this basically in situ precursor, is when you have this and mucinous carcinoma is growing out of this, you can be essentially certain that what you're dealing with is a primary skin tumor and not a metastasis. So looking for this background entity is more than just an academic exercise. It actually can give you a definitive answer or as close to definitive as we can get maybe, that what you're seeing is arising in the skin as a primary skin tumor and metastasis is not a question. So I think I have seen like one mucinous carcinoma of the colon that metastasized like to the, the thigh or somewhere. I, I've seen it once a metastasis, but ne again, never near the eye. 
So, but when you find this, you know that you're dealing with a primary skin tumor. So the way that you can tell is when you look closely at the lining, you have the apical cells, just like you have in a hydrocystoma, the apical cells and all of the complex infolding here and growth, but there's a layer of basal cells, kind of analogous to the myoepithelial cells of the breast, right? These are kind of the basal cell layer that you see in normal sweat ducts. And you can highlight these with immunohistochemistry using basal cell type markers. So here's an example. This is an immunostain for P63. And you could use P40, which is essentially uh, is an analog of P63, as I'm sure you all know. And in my hands, P63 and P40 work almost the same with occasional exceptions. I like P40 a little bit better. I feel like it's a little cleaner and more crisp. And there are a few things that it will do better, like metastatic lung adenocarcinoma that sometimes goes to the skin. And lung adenos can stain with P63, but usually not with P40. So I, if you have P40, go, use that. But if you only have P63, that's okay. This is P63. So just as a reminder, P63 stains the nuclei of most of the normal epithelial structures of the skin. That includes the epidermis, the hair follicle epithelium, and many components of the sweat ducts and sweat glands, okay? So the, the reason that's important to know is that in the skin, if you have a tumor that is derived from the epidermis or from the adnexa, either benign or malignant, usually it will have diffuse, strong nuclear staining with P63 and P40. So that can help you, especially in the context of something in the adenocarcinoma family. If you see an adenocarcinoma in the skin, and it's strongly P40 positive, it's a good chance that it's coming from the skin, from a sweat gland or sweat duct origin, not a metastasis from the visceral organs because most adenocarcinomas of the viscera are negative for P40 and P63 with the exception being that some long adenos can express P63, which is why we use P40 in the first place, right? Is because of my understanding historically is it's pulmonary pathologists and the necessity of distinguishing between adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma, that that's where they started using P40 because of its better specificity for squamous cell versus adeno in the lung. So the, um, the, in the skin, remember that squamous cell carcinomas, basal cell carcinomas, seborrheic keratoses, all of those should usually have P63 and P40 expression and most sweat gland and hair follicle and sebaceous tumors will also. Now there are some exceptions. And one of those big exceptions is mucinous carcinoma, is usually negative for P63 and P40. And also apocrine carcinomas is, is variable. They sometimes will have some staining, but, but not always. So here we can see that the mucinous carcinoma is negative for P63, as we would expect. But the endocrine mucin-producing sweat gland carcinoma, we can see that the inner cells, probably the cells that the mucinous carcinoma arises from, that inner layer of cells, they're analogous to the invasive mucinous carcinoma component. But the basal layer here is staining nicely with P63. That is basically evidence that this is an in situ lesion arising in a dilated sweat duct. And then, therefore, the invasive component here, logically, is arising from this in situ precursor, and therefore it is primary to the skin and not a metastasis. So unfortunately, I don't have pictures of the, um, the endocrine markers in this case, but uh, they will stain very nicely. I feel like they are not always diffuse. Sometimes it's patchy, as is often the case, I think, with neuroendocrine markers. So you may have to look carefully, but INSM1, uh, insulinoma-like protein one, is uh, really nice. It works very nicely if you have that in your lab. So that is the importance of this case, is go look for the precursor lesion. And sometimes it will be large, like this, but other times you might only find a little, where was it, a little area. Is it cut through? That's probably a tiny, tiny bit of it there. 
but go look closely because it can be a clue to help you identify. Or if you see the mucinous carcinoma and on immunostain, you can find that layer. So I will often, if I, if I can't see it on H&E, I will sometimes do P63 or P40 to look for that in situ component to confirm uh, the skin origin of the lesion, all right? So the question here in the chat box is, what's your opinion regarding endocrine, mucin-producing sweat gland carcinoma versus primary carcinoid of the skin reported by Dr. Kesuke Goto, who's a friend of mine from Japan. We wrote, wrote a, a nice paper, to, well, I thought it was nice, but I'm biased because I was a co-author, but we wrote a paper together on a really nice case of cutaneous sparganosis, which is a, a rare parasitic infection that occurs uh, it can occur all over the world, but is most common in, in some Asian countries, um, I think because of dietary um, eating of a raw reptile or amphibian meat, like raw snake or frog meat, which I try not to do. Um, but anyway, he posted a case uh, some years ago on Facebook, and I said, we need to write this up. It's beautiful. And so we did, and that was fun. And it got published actually on the cover of the Journal of Cutaneous Pathology twice on accident, two months in a row. So I actually have both. I want to frame them one day. I only put it one time on my curriculum vitae. You know, well, I put both references, but I only count it as one paper. But I thought it was cool. It was just a glitch in the publishing process. But I thought it was kind of fun. So now you know that story. But anyway, uh, Dr. Goto writes really excellent papers. I have not read his paper on primary carcinoid of the skin. I have heard rare, rare cases of carcinoid in the skin. And I'm not, I'm not sure if there is a relationship here or not. I have also seen rare examples of metastatic neuroendocrine carcinoma in the skin arising from internal primary sites. Um, and I've, I've also seen some rare examples of metastatic small cell lung cancer in the skin. But I feel like it's a little bit different than, than this here. But, um, but I don't know, and I've not read his paper yet, which is another thing on my to-do list when I get back home, is to read that. Thank you for that question. All right. so. That's a, this entity, so it's a bit of a long name to remember, endocrine mucin producing sweat gland carcinoma. And I can't remember in my handout if I put in... Uh, uh, yes? Uh, as I am not a dermatopathologist, uh, uh, I've never seen this entity. And uh, uh, I don't know in which cells the, um, the, the, um, the endocrine marker are positive. So the, end, the question is, in this entity, where will the endocrine markers be positive? Usually, they will be expressed in all of these. Or sometimes it will be, again, patchy. It may not be totally diffuse, but you'll see staining here. But it will not be positive in the, in the, the, in the invasive component? Oh, the invasive component can be positive. That's a question. So the invasive mucinous carcinoma can be positive for neuroendocrine markers. So in the past, I've thought, well, if you have a mucinous carcinoma of the skin and it's neuroendocrine positive, to me, that suggests that maybe it could be arising from this. But someone had pointed out to me that uh, neuroendocrine markers have been reported in mucinous carcinomas of other sites, like the breast. I have not done intense reading on that, and I'm not a breast pathologist, but I have been notified by other people that that's not a totally specific feature, that you can see it. But I have seen endocrine carcinoma, I'm sorry, a mucinous carcinomas near the eye that had no obvious uh, in situ precursor, but that had strong neuroendocrine markers. And I felt like that was probably further support. But then, then, like I said, other people have said, well, in other parts of the body too, you can have neuroendocrine markers in a mucinous carcinoma. So it's a bit of a challenging area. The good news is that prognostically, these are indolent. Both the invasive and the in situ components here have a good prognosis and can usually be treated successfully with surgical excision. I think the bigger problem is when you start worrying about metastasis, that creates a lot of extra anxiety for the patient, a lot of extra workup, um, and, and sometimes that needs to be done, but um, that, that can be a difficulty for the patient and the treating physician.